In this segment, we introduce a means to represent all pixels in an image as a vector. This then introduces an alternative way for representing the degradation equation in the restoration problem. It becomes a vector matrix equation. If the degradation is LSI, then this degradation matrix has a specific form. It is a block circulant matrix. It is straightforward to describe this matrix in the spectral domain by finding its eigenvalues and eigenvectors. We study this property, which allows us to take the degradation equation to the frequency domain, something, of course, we know we can do based on the material we covered in week three. The reason, of course, we devoted this lecture to study this alternative representation of images and the matrix vector version of the degradation equation is not to just do some math, but because they provide a flexible representation of images and systems that process them. And they're also useful since we can now easily borrow tools and results from linear algebra and optimization theory in providing solutions to these inverse problems we are interested in. Before we, we proceed, we'd like to introduce a vector notation for images and then a matrix vector notation for the convolution equation. So let's assume we have a, an image of dimensions n by m. So this is the image here. The standard way we've been using so far to represent an image is x, n1, and 2 where n1 ranges from 0 to n minus 1, and n2 from 0 to m minus 1. We would like to represent this two-dimensional array, this image, as a one-dimensional vector. So I'd like to write this image as a vector x. And now vectors can be shown in boldface or sometimes with an underbar or an overbar. It should be clear from the context that a vector is involved. So one way to do it is to take each row of the original image. So here's row 0, row 1, row n minus 1 and turn each row into a column vector. So this is row 0 transpose. So it comes here, row 1 transpose, all the way down to row n minus 1 transpose. So the n by m image is now converted into an n m times 1 vector. So this is the process of stacking an image into a vector. And if the stacking is as shown here, I stack by rows, then it's also referred to as lexicographic ordering. So it should be clear from now on that uh, this functional representation x function of n1 and 2 and this vector representation can mean the same thing, mean the same thing in what follows. Let us consider the one-dimensional convolution of two one-dimensional signals, x of n convolved with h of n. Let's call the result equal to y of n, and we know that this is equal to the sum over k, x of k, h, n minus k. Let's assume for simplicity that x of n has support from 0 to n minus 1, n samples in other words. h of n has support from 0 to l minus 1. And as we know, the result of the convolution will have support the sum of the limits of the support, so from 0 to n plus L minus 2. I would like to consider all the values of the signal Y and stack them into a vector. So I'd like to form the vector Y0, Y1, all the way to Yn plus L minus 2. 
so this vector is an n plus l minus 1 by 1 vector so this will be equal to a matrix here that will multiply the signal x so here is x0 x1 x of n minus 1 so x clearly has dimensions n by 1 and therefore this matrix has dimensions n plus l minus 1 times n so if we follow the steps of the convolution we take h we flip it around find h of minus k and then shift it by n we can see that y0 is equal to h0 times x0 y1 is equal to h1 times x0 plus h0 times x1 then I'll have here this row of h's and the rest of the values here not shown they're all zero so if I call this a vector y and call this matrix H and then a vector X I wrote in matrix vector form the result of the convolution by considering all the values of, of the signals I can kind of combine them all into this matrix vector form again Y equals HX we observe that H has this specific um, form that is the values along each diagonal are equal and this is referred to as a Toeplitz matrix. We'll see next that by modifying the signal and the matrix, we can write indeed the, the matrix vector form for, for the circular convolution, and then this matrix H is going to have another form which we'll call circular matrix. I would like to perform the circular convolution of x of n with h of n so that the result of the circular convolution equals that of the linear convolution. In order for this to be the case, I should carry out the circular convolution with period n plus l minus 1. Let's call this y of n again. So this means I should pad x of n with l minus 1 zeros and then carry out the circular convolution. So if I do the same thing here now, which is to put all the values of y into a vector, This will be equal to a square matrix now, multiplying x. And x, I'll have the original values of x, 0, 1, all the way to n minus 1, and then I'll pad it with zeros, and the number of zeros is equal to l minus 1. So if we look at the structure of H here, this matrix, it will have H0 on its main diagonal, H1 on the diagonal below it, all the way to H L minus 1. will be 0 here. And then at this corner will be H1, H2, H L minus 1. And I'll have, let's say here, H L minus 1. And 0 everywhere else. It's easy to verify that indeed the values you ob obtain here by carrying out this matrix vector multiplication are equal these y values to the values we obtained from the linear convolution as shown in the previous slide. So again I can write y equals hx. h now has 
also a special structure. The structure now is that if I take any row of H and I circularly shift it by one to the right, then, and circular means that the element that leaves the matrix due to this shift to the right wraps around, it appears at the other end of the, of the row, uh, at the beginning of the row. And I'll do, I can do this for all rows, including the last row. So if I circularly shift the last row, I'll obtain the first row. So this matrix is called the circulant matrix and has some useful properties that we will talk about next. We saw in the previous slide that if I use a matrix vector representation of circular convolution, I end up with a circulant matrix. Here's a simple example of a 4x4 circulant matrix. So the element of the first row are these, A1, A2, A3, A4. I generate the second row by circularly shift the first, shifting the first one. So this is A1, A2, A3. A4 wraps around and comes to this place. A1, A2, A3, A4 wrap around. And finally, A1, A4. A3, A2. So clearly for this 4x4 four four matrix, uh, if I know the elements of its first row, I can define the whole matrix since again, one row, each row is generated by the circular shift of the row above it. So if I look at the general matrix H, it's a circular matrix. The elements of the first row are H0 to H M minus 1. I don't write the remaining of the rows since, again, will be circular shifts of the first one. For any circulant matrix, finding its eigenvalues and eigenvectors, which is by and large a difficult problem, is rather straightforward. And this is so because, let me first denote by lambda and W its eigenvectors are the w's and lambda are the eigenvalues. So the eigenvectors of any circular matrix are known in advance. The nth eigenvector is equal to this. And one should recognize right away that these are the basis vectors of the discrete Fourier transform, these complex exponentials. And the set of eigenvalues are simply the discrete Fourier transform values of the first row of the matrix. So again, a very straightforward and important property of circular matrices. So the singular value decomposition of the original matrix is simply equal to this. I put the eigenvectors here as column vectors of the matrix. The eigenvalues become the diagonals element of a diagonal matrix. This matrix is the first one. Actually, this should be zero here. Uh, the first one minus one. It's a 